Good morning. This is Lynn Beasy in the sanctuary here at First Presbyterian Church in Jacksonville. I'm going to be reading Psalm 116 as we call ourselves to worship today. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pang of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return my soul to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with for you have delivered my soul from death. My tears and my feet have stumbled. I walked before the Lord in the land of the living. I kept my faith even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving maid. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, Praise the Lord. Please join me for the prayer of the day. O oh God, your Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in his redeeming work, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, and I hope you everybody has had a good week so far and that things are going well with you and you're staying healthy. Our moment for children this morning is going to deal with pickles. Now, I've got dill pickles and I've got bread and butter sweet pickles. Now we know that dill pickles are very sour, sometimes bitter, we make a face when we eat them, and they're salty, and they're not good by themselves really. And sweet pickles, we, they taste good to us. We like them on different things, and we can just eat them right out of a jar without any problem. But you know what? Life is like pickles. Sometimes we have dill pickle days. And when we have dill pickle days, things just don't go our way. Sometimes that we're sad, or sometimes we don't want to eat what mom has put on the table for us. And we don't want to put our toys up. We just don't want to do anything that we really are supposed to do. So we call those our sour days. But then we have days that are just going perfect. Everything, our hair does right. Uh, Mom cooks our favorite dessert. She lets us have cook cookies. Our toys are just where we can find them. And those are our sweet days. But you know what? We have to have a little sour mixed in with our little sweet. And that's what Jesus does. He knows that we have sour days. And he cares about our sour days. And that's why he's there for us. To help us transition from our sour days to our sweet days. So when you find yourselves kind of in the dumps and kind of on a sour note, just think, Jesus loves me and Jesus cares for me. And I'm going to make it a sweet day. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you for being the one who loves us and turning our sour days into sweet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
spending some time with us uh, during these strange and difficult days. Uh, I'm Jay Robinson, uh, the director of the Wesley Foundation at Jacksonville State University. We've been helping out for a little over a year at uh, First Presbyterian here in town. Um, thank you for letting me uh, be a part of our virtual worship. Our uh, reading this morning uh, for us from the Gospel of Luke uh, in the 24th chapter. I'll be reading from the uh, Common English Bible, a, a more uh, recent and modern translation of the Greek New Testament. And we pick the story up um, as Luke is um, on the day of the first Easter as a part of the big story of Easter. And we pick the story up as Luke tells it um, that afternoon. This is the word of the Lord. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem? who is unaware of the things that have taken place over the last few days. He said to them, what things? They said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago. But there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women said. They didn't see him. And Jesus said to them, You foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all the things the prophets talk about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going on ahead. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, it's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went and stayed with them. After he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? They got right up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying to each other, the Lord really has risen. He appeared to Simon. Then the two disciples described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, of course, they tell the story. Our brains are wired for story. They don't Describe theology, they're not describing uh, um, con concepts. They are trying to make sense of what has happened. And the only way to do that is to tell the story. Disciples who tell the story to this stranger. The stranger, 
uh, interpreting for them that story in the larger context of the big story from Moses to the prophets. And, and then they go tell the story to the other disciples back in Jerusalem. And that's really all they had was the story of what had happened to them, the story of Jesus, the story of their own experience. And so naturally, when they tell that story, they tell it in the ways that we typically tell stories, which is through the lens of conflict. It's the easiest way to tell a story, especially if you've got less than two hours and you're making a movie, you got to get things in really fast. And so we are accustomed to hearing and telling stories based and rooted in conflict. It's a natural part of our lived experience. Conflict is a real thing. So when, when the stranger, who doesn't seem to know the story of Jesus, is told the story, all they know or their instinct is to tell the story from the lens of conflict. How Jesus was a prophet, but the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees banded together to subvert him, to have him arrested, and to crucify him. And then... We have been told stories from the women that the tomb is empty. So there's the conflict internal. Um, am I, what am I to make with these stories that we've been told? And there is the external story of literal conflict, of, of argument, of crucifixion, and of death. Conflict is a normal way that we describe what's happening to us. And it would be a very easy way right now in these times to discuss what's happening to us from the lens of conflict. It is the easiest story to tell. The story of conflict is based in its most simplest form in a binary. So there's the good guy and the bad guy. There's good versus evil. There's winning versus losing. And when our lives are um, turned upside down, or at least just put things on hold, when the natural order of things um, is thrown out of kilter, it is somewhat natural for us to want to describe what's happening in the terms of conflict. Um, I did that practically every time I preached as a young pastor. Um, I hadn't studied theology. Uh, by the way, I began preaching when I was 15. I don't know why. I, I, I'm embarrassed. If I were to go back and look or listen to any of that, for years I kept my notes from those days. I've long since got rid of that. As a teenage preacher, preaching in revivals on Sand Mountain, um, we preached about conflict. Um, it, was a, it was the worldview, it was the lens through which I saw spirituality. Conflict between good and evil, God versus the devil, the righteous versus sinners. And, and there was always the villain in my preaching. Um, my, I, I learned how to preach by watching uh, the country revival preachers. And I grew up with, and also the TV preacher, um, Jerry Falwell. So I didn't necessarily know except to kind of copy what I had seen. And it was all very much us versus them conflict. Us being the righteous, them being the, the secularists, kicking God out of the classroom. The abortionists, uh, the liberals, uh, the communists, or the socialists. The, the enemy was clearly uh, described in all of my early preaching. And, and that's, the, that's the danger of, of seeing um, life and, and, and interpreting what's going on through exclusively this lens of conflict. Because we, we imagine then, through our motivated reasoning, uh, that um, we are the big guys. 
uh, and whoever the they are, therefore, must be the enemy that is to be vanquished. There's this um, television show that's been on for decades called Survivor. That the plot and the premise of it is let's let's put people on a let's strand people on purpose on a desert island or some remote area, and let's watch them fight with each other. And and then they and then the losers get voted off the island. And and we we you put people in this environment, and the assumption is that we will create alliances. We will naturally engage in conflict, uh, subterfuge, backstabbing, and somehow this is, makes for good TV. Uh, they tell me that's what the show's about. I've never seen it um, because I don't like contrived conflict, made up conflict, where the only way we know how to tell a story is to tell it pitting one person against another. That somehow that we're in this this cosmic ultimate struggle and I've got to win. In order for me to win, you have to lose. It is easy for that to be the story of our culture. It's easy for that to be the way we deal with crisis, is that we put it in this same context of conflict. We see this played out practically every single day in the national briefing of the coronavirus task force. The wannabe hero in conflict with members of the press, in conflict with the scientists, in conflict with science itself, in conflict with governors, in conflict with the World Health Organization. As if, as if the way that we tell the story is, um, there's a, a hero in charge. If we would just shut up and listen to the hero, then the hero would vanquish our foes. I guess that works if you're producing a Marvel movie. I don't necessarily think that, that works when the entire people of the world are in the exact same struggle, facing the exact same crisis. Conflict is our story. This is how we human beings what's happening to us. Conflict is not the story of God. There is conflict in the story because the story has human characters. But conflict is not the way of God. The way of God is also being demonstrated on a daily basis all around the world as people put on a limited supply of personal protective equipment and they serve. They give quite literally all they have. to be instruments of healing. So the story of God is a story of giving, of self-giving, of self-sacrifice. That in the big picture of the narrative of God, um, winning is not defined by vanquishing our enemies. It is defined through service, sacrifice. And as Jesus described it himself, willingly being last of all, taking the last seat, being last in line, thinking of others We are not in a war, and it is, it is destructive for us to use.
use that kind of language. Because our language of conflict suggests that it is man, humanity, against nature. That somehow we are in a fight against the natural order. And it is destructive for us in our, in our minds and our souls to continually think in terms of conflict. That, that we imagine that if we can just beat this enemy, then everything will go back to normal. As if normal was actually good for the earth. As if we can just continue on as we were, propagating one of the great die-offs of the natural order of things. We don't think about this massive die-off because it's insects, and it's birds, and it's frogs, and it's coral, and it's things that we don't see every single day. But we were already living in the midst of the earth dying. And one of the, one of the amazing things that's happened as human beings have gone indoors, how quickly the earth is kind of resetting the natural order of things. There was a coyote walking down Michigan Avenue in Chicago this week. Now, I'm not rooting for coyotes. I'm just saying um, <clears throat> that um, we aren't necessarily doing ourselves or the world any good by putting concrete on top of the earth and by filling the earth with our toxins. There, have, there has been a disease like this one, a new, a new virus every year for the last several decades. The people who study this know that it was just a matter of time before a virus like this one moved quickly throughout the whole world. So the notion that somehow we're in this conflict with this one singular virus, that if we just beat that one virus, and everything go back to normal, because wasn't normal great? So the story of God, which is not based on that kind of conflict, is instead based on a kind of harmony. The story of God is is based on humility. It's based on caring for strangers. It's based on working together, overcoming our conflict. So as the prophets would say, the story of God is beating our swords into plowshares, our spears into instruments of agriculture to feed the world. We should not allow ourselves during these days to think that conflict will save us. What will save us is when we learn love one another and to live in harmonic balance with each other and with the natural world. Our faith teaches us that we are stewards of God's earth. It is not us for us to exploit. It is not for us to tame. It is not for us to be in conflict with. It is for us to learn how to live and work together in peace. So my prayer for you is a prayer for peace. And how the early, those early disciples, when they encountered Jesus that they didn't recognize, he was a stranger to them. And yet they welcomed him into their home. Created not a 
piece of conflict or misunderstanding or of confusion, but a place of peace. And they invited a stranger into their home in an act of generosity. When they shared their food, they recognized that it was Jesus all along. May God bless you and your family during these days, especially. May God keep you safe. join me in a spirit of prayer as we pray for the people of this world. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray and to offer our petitions to you in his name. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers for others may serve your will and show your steadfast love through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. God, our creator, you made all things in your wisdom and in your love you save us. We pray for the whole creation, overthrow evil powers, right what is wrong, feed and satisfy those who thirst for justice, so that all your children may freely enjoy the earth you have made and joyfully sing your praises through our Lord Jesus Christ. Gracious God, you have called us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Keep us one in faith and service, breaking bread and proclaiming the good news to the world that all may believe you are love and turn to your ways. Let us live in the light of your truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Eternal God, you sent us a Savior, Christ Jesus, to break down the walls of hostility that divide us. Send peace on earth and put down greed, pride, and anger, which turn nation against nation and race against race. Speed the day when wars will end and the whole world accepts your rule through Jesus Christ, our Lord. O God, whom we cannot love unless we love our neighbors, remove hate and prejudice from us and from all people so that your children may be reconciled with those we fear, with those we resent, and those who threaten us. May we come to live together in your peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Almighty God, sovereign are you over the nations. Direct those who make, administer, and judge our laws. We ask your guidance for our president and for others in authority among us, that guided by your wisdom, they may lead us in the ways of righteousness and well-being. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Eternal ruler, hope of all the earth, give vision to those who serve in other countries to those who govern, that they may be led by goodwill and justice to take down barriers and draw us together in one world of peace and reconciliation. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world. And in this time of great trial, in this time of crisis, we ask that you look with compassion on those who are sick. Cheer them by your word. For those who have journeyed into the life eternal, may their journey be swift, may their hearts know peace, and may those who mourn be comforted. Your sign of healing is all around us, Lord. May you direct our ways. May you direct those who are in positions of caregiving, for those who are continuing to serve in places of work, in needed areas of our life that are to be sustained. We lift all of those who are serving and working, those who are staying home, that they may be not lonely, but filled with spirit, through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We know that there are many, Lord, who are in places of sorrow. You are the God of comfort. We lift up the promise given to us in scripture, made real in the life, the death, and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. May we be sure that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, shall separate us from your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray, Lord, for those who are closest to us. For you are the God who has blessed us with relationships and families and friends. 
In this altered time, may we find a new way of closeness, a closeness of spirit and heart that draws us more fully into your kingdom, proclaimed by your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God of all generations, we praise you for all your servants who have been faithful to you on earth and now live with you in heaven. Keep us in fellowship with them until we meet with all your children in the joy of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Almighty God, whose word we trust and whose spirit enables us to pray, accept our request and further those which will bring about your purpose for your world. Through Jesus Christ, who rules over all things, 